I carefully split the chocolate bar, hearing my own heartbeat. This was our last meal. I handed a half to Jan and looked thoughtfully out the rocket's window. Space seemed endless, and we still had seven years to fly. I couldn't imagine being in this situation. All my life, I dreamed of flying into space. I was always interested in astronautics, and after school, I went to the cosmonaut training center. I was the best in the class, but I still hadn't been to space once. And when I was offered to go on an expedition to Mars, I agreed without hesitation. But all the fun was ruined by Jan, my colleague. When I found out that he was going with me, I almost refused to participate. Ever since the training center, I couldn't stand the slacker, and he didn't like me. He always called me inert, and once he stole my test, and I almost failed the exam. And now I had to go into space with him for seven years. It was a living a nightmare. I tried to persuade management to change my partner, but they were adamant. Jen was the only one who was suitable for the expedition on medical indicators. What? He can't tell the control wheel from the handle. There was only one reason I did say no. This was my dream. I had been going to it all my life, and I wouldn't give it up because of Jan. He wasn't happy about my company either. A few days before the flight, I stayed in the center, and I heard voices in the hallway. It was Jan. I pressed myself against the wall and listened. He loudly discussed me with his friend. They said I was such a bore, and he would die of boredom in seven years with me. I was so pissed off. Annoyed, I returned home. I had no idea how I was going to get along with Jan. And now the launch day arrived. I saw Jan's smug face even before he went up to the rocket. We looked at each other scornfully. I was about to stop into the rocket when someone in the crowd shouted, You need to shake hands! Would Jan? No way! But I knew from the look in Chief's eyes that it was better not to contradict him. Gritting my teeth, I shook Jan's hand. After that, we took our seats in the rocket, and the launch began. I could hear the countdown, and my heart was pounding in my chest. My dream would come true. The engine roared. While we were taking off, I only made a couple of quips to Jan. It was amazing how he finished his training. I thought he'd be kicked out on the first day. He started to say something, but then the rocket rocked. We were leaving the atmosphere. This was one of the most dangerous moments in flight. My stomach clenched with fear. If only it would work. I sank back into my chair. And just when I thought that everything was fine, the jolt was repeated. I screamed, and Jan suddenly looked at me with concern saying that everything went well. I don't need to be taught. A couple of hours later, I unbuckled myself from my chair and headed for the dining room to eat. But when I opened the cabinets where the food was supposed to be, I was confused. They were empty. I rushed to open cabinets, drawers, rummaged through the kitchen. But nothing. My heart sank. We were left in space without food. I went back to Jen and told him in a trembling voice, that we didn't have food, but he thought it was a joke and went to double check. When he returned, he was as black as thunder. Did you see it? I covered my face with my hands and slowly sank into the chair. Despair washed over me. What to do? Jan went to the onboard computer. He wanted to send a signal to Earth. Exactly. With a sinking heart, I waited for the result. But the onboard computer still didn't respond, and then the whole rocket rang out. Access error. No! I pushed Jan away and frantically tried to send messages, but each one gave me an error. Tears welled up in my eyes. I don't want to die! And then Jan touched my shoulder reassuringly. I flinched. And he said, we can handle it. Somehow I felt better. I sobbed. Yes, we can handle it. The first day we spent without food, I didn't even want to talk to Jan, but he suggested that we tell each other some stories to ignore the hunger. I wanted to say no, but my stomach was already howling. I nodded reluctantly. It turned out that Jan wasn't so unbearable after all. We had a lot in common, and obviously, Jan was doing stand-ups at night. I couldn't explain how he managed to make <laughs> me laugh in such a situation. But the next day, the hunger became unbearable. I was dizzy from hunger, and as I got to my feet, I began to sway. Jan noticed this, and suddenly, he threw me a bar. I looked at Jan in disbelief. He just shrugged. He always carried snacks with him to class too. It used to annoy me, but now his habits saved us from starvation. 
Yeah. But I didn't understand why he shared it with me. Jen and I had always been rivals, and then suddenly he saved me from starvation. I asked him quietly why he hadn't eaten everything himself, to which Jen rolled his eyes. We may hate each other, but not enough to let us starve to death. Wow, I didn't expect this from Jen at all, and I sincerely thanked him. Maybe he was not as bad as I thought. Although, this did not change the fact that he was a slacker. We ate the bars, but now we were terribly thirsty. I was going over the lectures in my head and then, exactly, a rocket map. I jumped up and immediately opened it. There should be a cache in the ship in case of an emergency. And there it was. My heart began to beat faster. Maybe there was food in there. We went to the rear of the rocket and came across a small door without a handle. Jan asked irritably what I was going to open it with. With my mind, I chuckled. We shouldn't have slept in class. I entered the security code on the screen next to the door. The door should have opened immediately, but nothing happened. My palms were sweating with excitement. Did I mix the numbers? But then the door slid open abruptly. I looked at Jan with a triumphant expression. Bite me! But as soon as we entered, my joy was gone. The shelves were empty. Jan put a hand on my shoulder. It's too early to despair. We'll search everything first. Although there was no hope, we began to search the shelves, drawers, but all for nothing. I didn't hide my despair. If we could survive without food, we couldn't survive without water for more than three days. And then Jan, seeing my condition, just hugged me. For the first time, I didn't find this touch repulsive. On the contrary, I felt warm and comfortable, and I buried my nose in his shoulder. We stood there for a couple of minutes until Jan pulled back and looked into my eyes. I'll give you a lift. Look at the shelves under the ceiling, alright? I nodded slowly, and the next second, I was sitting on Jan's shoulder. I didn't expect to find anything, but then my eyes fell on a box. I struggled to pull it open and peered inside. My breath caught in my throat. Water! He helped me lower the box and set me down. We did it! Jan looked at me with undisguised admiration. He said softly that he knew I could handle it. I looked away, embarrassed. I got an A in my studies not for nothing. We immediately took a drink of water and just relaxed as the rocket suddenly started shaking. We ran back to the computer in a panic and then I shivered. Asteroids were coming at us. I frantically tried to remember something from class, but my head was empty. I stood there, frozen. Then Jan pushed me away and took the wheel firmly. Everything was shaking, but Jan didn't seem to notice. He maneuvered so fast that I gasped in admiration. Soon, we flew around all the meteorites. The danger was over. Jan leaned back in his chair. It was like he played a computer game. I was amazed at him. Jan raised his eyebrows and asked, a little surprised, why I was frozen. I swallowed. It's just that I always thought you were a nerd, but now you were great. And suddenly Jan laughed. He always thought I was a nerd. But as it turned out, I was a fun and smart girl. And I couldn't help but smile. We sat on the floor and talked for a long time. And I didn't even notice that I fell asleep on Jan's shoulder. From fatigue and malnutrition, according to Jan, I slept for about 16 hours. And when I woke up, I saw that Jan was carrying me a pack of chips. Such a breakfast in bed. It touched me. Jan was so cute. We didn't run out of topics for communication. We discussed rockets, space, uh -huh. music, and art. All these days, I was never bored with him. Oh. Jan joked endlessly and made me <laughs> laugh. With him, I felt protected. Stop! Did I fall in love with Jan? How's that for timing? If only we'd known each other sooner. Instead of wasting our time in silly quarrels. At that moment, Jan came up to me. He wanted to say something, but he was interrupted by a siren? The onboard computer began to warn us about the approach to the black hole. I stared into the distance and realized with horror that a collision could not be avoided. Jan and I tried to turn the rocket around, but the computer didn't respond. And then suddenly, it crashed and blocked access to the system. That was all for sure now. I sighed and turned to Jan. Thank you for being with me all this time. You're the most amazing person I've ever met. Jan stared into my eyes for a long time, and at that moment, all the sounds seemed to fade into the background. Abruptly, he pulled me around the waist and kissed me. It was like a firework exploding inside. 
I looked at Jan in disbelief. The siren suddenly stopped, and the onboard computer reported that the danger was over. I didn't care about it anymore. I could still feel Jan's kiss on my lips. He whispered softly that he liked me. Tears melt up in my eyes. I like you too, Jan. He smiled, took the last bar out of his pocket, and handed it to me. That's how we ended up in this situation, and even though I hated Jan at first, I was grateful that he was the one who had gone into space with me. After all, when we lay in each other's arms and looked at the stars, I felt the happiest. And suddenly there was a round of applause. Jan and I looked around, confused. What's happening? As we ascended, the rocket door slowly opened. I didn't understand anything at all. We were in space. Jan took my hand and squeezed it tightly, telling me not to worry. But as soon as we got out of the rocket, we saw our training center. I was completely at a loss. Then the chief came up to us and smiled. We passed the test. What? It turned out that this was not a real flight, but a simulation, a training to see if Jan and I could work together. I was stunned. Stop. So this wasn't real? I immediately threw my arms around Jan's neck and hugged him tightly. We will live. Although I experienced a real horror in this simulation, my love for space had not disappeared. And a month later, Jan and I went on a real expedition. Only now I was happy to be flying with him. And seven years alone didn't scare me a bit. And this whole thing taught me one important rule. Do not waste time on quarrels. Sometimes you need to get to know a person better to understand that they are not as bad as you think they are. Did you like the video? Subscribe and like it. Support the channel. Thank you. Hi everybody, I'm Sarah. I'm 17 and I'm an ordinary schoolgirl. Have you ever fought bad habits that put your life at risk of falling apart? Did your friends support you doing everything they could to help you break free of it? Please watch this video till the end and you'll find out why it's so important to take care of your body. In general, I've always taken good care of myself. Since my childhood, I have been playing sports and ate healthy, and I've certainly never had any addictions. At least up to one point. This story happened to my friend Kevin and me. We practiced parkour together, and those days we were just starting to participate in competitions. We were a solid team and got along well. In fact, when we started playing sports together and thereby communicating even more, I realized that I had feelings for him, but I didn't dare to confess. The thing is, We've been friends since our childhood, and I didn't think he'd see me more than just a friend. Have you ever fallen in love with a childhood friend and been afraid of telling the truth to your crush? We trained a lot, and as a result, we used to win small competitions in our district. We were so encouraged by our progress. But one day, everything started to change. We got invited to a big competition for the parkour teams from all over the state. I was shopping at the supermarket and grabbed a can of Coke. Back then, I allowed myself to drink a couple of cans a week. The saleswoman advised me to pay attention to the bottom of the can. The company carried out an advertising campaign for five cola boxes. The one who bought the can with the number five at the bottom was the winner. When I looked at the bottom of my tin, I was pleasantly surprised to find a big five there. I've never won anything like this before. Soon, my winnings were delivered. My parents seeing those boxes shook their heads skeptically. They believed that even one can a week was not good for one's health, not to mention more. I assured them that I would not abuse fizzy beverages. However, with a box of Coke at hand, I didn't notice how I started drinking it constantly. It got to the point where I replaced my morning glass of water with Coke and stopped drinking anything except it at all. Meanwhile, Kevin and I started training for the competition. One day, we were practicing on the outskirts, and I found myself far behind him on the run. He came back to me and asked if something was wrong. I answered I was just tired, but that did not reassure him. Kevin told me I haven't been at my best lately. He said I started to stumble more often, to run slower, and I didn't look well. I refused to believe that. My mind denied everything he was saying and made various excuses. But deep down inside, I knew he was right. I really got addicted to cola. That moment, I realized that I had been drinking nothing but it for an entire week. No water, no coffee, no juice. Just Coke. 
Have you ever struggled with addiction that could seriously damage your health, but the habit seems stronger than your willpower? A few days later, the weakness increased. I became prone to restless, almost anxious sleep, so no matter how long I slept, I felt drowsy and often was late for training. I even put on weight, despite my active lifestyle. And yet I couldn't give up drinking some of those shiny red cans a day. My parents noticed that my Coke supplies were decreasing fast and claimed that I clearly consumed too much soda. But I lied to them, saying that I'm just sharing with my friends. Meanwhile, the first stage of the competition had come. We worked hard to get ready, but I was still worried. As we waited for our exit, Kevin tried to cheer me up. He assured me we could handle it and asked me how I felt. I replied that everything was okay. In fact, things were not even semi-okay. I felt myself on the verge of an epic fail. I was so nervous that I even spoke rude to Kevin when he asked again if everything was alright. At that moment, our way out was announced, and I saw that I had hurt his feelings. Oh, that made it all even harder. We entered the arena and started performing our well-rehearsed parkour stunts. At first, we were doing well. I saw that we were making a good impression on the audience and the jury. But at one crucial moment, a sudden stomach ache came on. Kevin grabbed me and helped me out, and did it spectacularly. That has repeated several times. Only thanks to Kevin, we completed the performance. When the jury announced the scores, I hoped for nothing. But as it turned out, we scored enough to pass to the next stage. We hugged happily, and I apologized to Kevin for being rude. He was not touchy. We decided to take a walk, and on the way, I took a can of Coke out of my bag. When Kevin noticed this, he asked me if I drank a lot of soda. Actually, I said, I haven't been drinking anything else for the last couple of weeks. I told him how it came to this, and that I couldn't break the habit. He persuaded me to give it up for the sake of our team. Well, I agreed. What else was I supposed to say? But then again, the very same night, I couldn't resist a can of Coke before sleep. And the next morning, I reached for another one as if I was moved uncontrollable. I had two more boxes of that fizzy black poison. And no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't make myself drink anything but it. Meanwhile, the next phase of the competition was every day closer. Kevin and I trained even more often because we barely made it last time. I felt worse and worse, I had stomach aches, my mood swings became bigger, but the scariest part was weight gaining. My parents also noticed my condition and believed no excuses anymore. But they didn't push me. They belonged to that kind of people who let their children make their own mistakes and learn from them. I was afraid to tell Kevin that I couldn't keep my promise. Because of this, I felt like I was moving away from him. Have you ever kept something from your friends because of fear of rejection? In the second stage, we miraculously once more scored points necessary to pass. And again, Kevin led the entire performance, while I just tried not to get in his way or fall. Thus, thanks to his efforts, we managed to reach the final. At that time, I had been addicted to coke for a month and felt really crappy. I couldn't drag myself out of bed without at least two cans. Well, the very last day before the final competition had come, I stayed home to acquire strength. Suddenly, Kevin showed up. He said he came to cheer me up and invite me for a final rehearsal. As he walked through the living room, he accidentally tripped over a can of coke, lying on the floor, looked at the can, and then looked at me. He calmly asked whether I had more soda. I didn't say a word, and my teammates started searching. I asked him to stop, but he didn't listen. He said that we have to try more radical ways to confront my addiction. Kevin found the remaining half a box under the sofa. With it, he went outside and started to pour cola onto the grass. I ran after him sobbing, begging him to stop, but he went on in silence. I was furious. I accused Kevin of being obsessed with winning and told him to compete without me. Upon hearing this, he threw the remaining cans on the ground and left. I believed I was right. My body, my rules. The next day, I was still mad at Kevin and didn't want to go to the competition, so I told him. Just as the final was about to begin, a mutual friend of ours called me. She asked where I was and said that Kevin was waiting for me. I told her what happened and complained that Kevin didn't care about me at all. My friend laughed. She said that Kevin was completely lost without me. Moreover, Kevin told her that he had a crush on me. I couldn't believe my ears and asked my friend if she was sure. She said yes, 100% sure. 
At that moment, I took a completely different view of everything Kevin did. I realized that he wasn't trying to win at all cost. Instead, he was worried about me. I promised my friend to come soon and hurried to get ready. I still could make it to our performance, so I ran as fast as I could. I arrived just at the moment when our team was being announced. Kevin happily smiled when he saw me. I smiled back, and we entered the arena together. Let's admit we performed poorly, and of course lost. It was already a miracle that we made it this far. But we didn't care. We made up, and I promised Kevin to break up with Coke forever. And I'm proud of saying that this time I managed to keep my promise. In the end, I realized that even though my body belongs to me, there are people who are hurt to watch how I destroy myself. That night, I told Kevin that I knew about his feelings and that it was mutual. He was happy. He confessed that he had been in love with me for years and just like me, was simply afraid to take the first step. We still practice parkour, but now we do it for ourselves, without tournaments and prizes. We realize that competitiveness is not our style. Sports were just our favorite way to spend time together. It took a while to get back on the rails after my soft drink abuse. I took my lifestyle more seriously and now follow a balanced diet that excludes any junk food. No more chips, fries, burgers, etc. Have you ever overcome your bad habits? Tell us in the comments. If you enjoyed my story, please like it. And to be the first to watch new stories, subscribe and push the bell. Stay tuned and have a nice day. A chicken! A live chicken! My stomach immediately rumbled. My legs led me to a chicken running around the yard, and at one point, I grabbed it, inhaling this delicious smell. This was the only way I could satisfy my hunger. There was no choice. I brought the struggling chicken to my lips and opened my mouth. I lived with my younger brother Nicholas and raised him. Although we had a house that we inherited, the money from the rare part-time jobs was only enough for basic things like food and paying bills. Nevertheless, I never asked for help from anyone. After all, people do not help for free, and it's humiliating. And I always told my brother that we could only rely on each other. We coped well together. But one day, I had a very bad stomach ache. The pills did not help and I had to go to the clinic. After the examination, the doctor's words horrified me. He said that I had a rare, dangerous disease, my stomach was self-destructing, and I needed an expensive surgery. Tears welled up in my eyes. I didn't have so much money. But the doctor suddenly announced that for such cases, they had an experimental development. A device that was attached to the stomach and prevented its destruction. And most importantly, everything was completely free. Because this method of treatment was still being tested, I was wary. Free help was suspicious, but I remembered about my brother, who would stay with him if I was not there. It was worth the risk for Nicholas. I signed the agreement, and on the same day, I was hospitalized. After the surgery, my stomach finally stopped hurting, and a few days later, I was discharged. Nicholas was insanely happy to see me healthy and gradually, we returned to normal life. The only thing was that after eating, I always felt sick, and gradually, I reduced the portions, less and less every day, until I realized food did not attract me at all. Even more than that, I couldn't eat at all. I began to lose weight, but I tried not to pay attention. Maybe it was just a side effect after the surgery and everything would pass soon, but one day, a neighbor came to us and asked for salt. And while he was talking to me, I couldn't take my eyes off him. How he smelled! It was crazy! I gave him the salt, and then the neighbor came very close. I couldn't help it. The smell was driving me crazy. It was the shirt that smelled like this. And the second I attacked him, trying to bite off at least a piece of fabric. The neighbor threw me back in horror and rushed into the yard, and I was left with a button. Pulled out and did not understand what was happening. I tried to eat… his shirt? What? 
I thought it was a simple misunderstanding, but the next day, when I was going to work part-time and put on my shoes, I stared at the shoe. The laces on it glittered so appetizing, like chocolate. I licked my lips. My stomach rumbled harder, and at that moment, I went nuts. I pulled out the lace and swallowed it with an appetite. And then, my hunger subsided. I froze in horror. What the hell was that? Instead of working part-time, I immediately went back to the clinic. I described my symptoms to them, but the clinic receptionist kindly replied that this was a side effect of the surgery. Everything would pass soon. I was returning home by bus. The doctor's words made me feel better. I couldn't wait for this effect to pass. I was so lost in my thoughts that I didn't even notice how I started chewing on a tie of a man sitting next to me. Only when he shouted angrily at me to stop, I came to my senses, and I was completely confused. Since then, the hunger became stronger, the stomach rumbled, and I didn't want simple food. Due to exhaustion, I didn't have the strength to lift my bag. Nicholas saw that something was wrong with me, and he was very worried. But I calmed him down and told him that this side effect would soon pass. One day, Nicholas was doing his homework. But when he went to get water, I suddenly looked at his notebook with homework. And this ink on the paper seemed so appetizing to me. Like a mad woman, I grabbed the notebook and stuffed it into my mouth. I chewed sheet after sheet. And just at that moment, Nicholas returned with a glass of water. He froze in shock and he asked what I was doing. I spat out the rest of the notebook and immediately joked that his homework was done disgustingly and that I had only done him a favor by eating it. My brother laughed and I calmly exhaled. The next morning, I woke up completely exhausted and went to wash my face. But when I squeezed the paste on the brush, I realized that it also smelled terribly delicious. And then I went into overdrive. I resolutely squeezed the entire tube of toothpaste into my mouth, but it wasn't enough. And I ate the tube itself. The hunger immediately receded, and I felt better. I was hungry, but my hunger did not recede. So I bought a batch of shoelaces at the nearest store and ate them like spaghetti, combined with paper, fabrics, and candy wrappers. And my favorite delicacy was a sandwich made of sawdust, covered with a slice of soap. And what about salad of candy wrappers? It was just divine. By a miracle, I managed to hide my food from Nicholas. And in front of him, I pretended to eat ordinary food. But at every opportunity, I threw it in the trash. I ate a lot, but I didn't gain weight because there were no nutrients in my food. A week later, I became very thin. Things were hanging on me. I needed normal food. One day, I went to work part-time in the village, and suddenly, I smelled the smell of chicken from someone's yard. A live chicken! I didn't even remember sneaking in there and grabbing it. I was so hungry! I brought it closer to my mouth, when suddenly, I froze. No, this was too much! I would not fall for this. I let go of the fried and chicken and immediately went to the clinic. I was stupid. I trusted strangers. I arrived and resolutely approached the receptionist. The side effect does not pass, but only increases. But the receptionist sighed and replied that, in fact, they saved my life. What am I complaining about? Saved my life? This experimental device was the same death, but slower and from exhaustion. I'll report you to the police, scammers. But the receptionist turned pale, showed me the folder, and said that I myself signed the agreement and the waiver of claims, so everything was legal. And no one in the police would even listen to me. Disappointed, I turned around and went out into the hall. Was this really the end? Then I noticed a very thin girl. She was walking irritated with a contract in her hand. Apparently, she was also refused to remove this device from her stomach. And then it hit me. No one would really listen to me alone. What if there were hundreds of us? Exactly. With the help of other people, I would achieve justice. I went up to the girl and asked her to distract the receptionist. She clearly wanted to take revenge on them and immediately agreed. While the girl was shouting and scolding the clinic, I grabbed a folder with permissions from the counter and rushed out of the clinic. All day, I called patients and listened to their horrifying stories and realized that this clinic was only hiding behind helping patients. In fact, they were researching new methods of treatment and putting illegal experiments on clients. We were lab rats for them. 
I was so angry. Therefore, in the morning, we gathered with all the victims at the clinic. The receptionist had to call a doctor and listen to all our demands to return everything as it was. Otherwise, they would face a long trial and media coverage. With so many complaints, they would definitely not get away. As a result of negotiations, the receptionist gave up, and we were all booked in for surgeries where the devices were removed from our stomachs. The clinic lost its license anyway. Some of their patients had contacts in the police. I was glad, but now I knew that I didn't have long to live. After all, without the device, the stomach continued to collapse. I realized once again that there's no such thing as a free lunch. And I was very surprised when the volunteers announced to me that they had jointly raised money for my surgery. It turned out that one of the victims was the owner of a fund to help people who got into a difficult life situation and decided to help me. I was so grateful. And Nicholas was literally jumping with happiness his little sister would live. And then I realized that I was wrong. After all, you can't live in constant distrust of people, and asking for help is not a shame and not scary. Yes, there are bad people in the world, but there are many more good people. And that's exactly what I want to be. That's why I got a job at that foundation. The world is no good without good people, and the main thing is to be among them and make it a little better. Did you like the video? Subscribe and like it! Support the channel! Thank you.